Energy Transition Now with David Linden. Hi everyone, I'm your host, David Linden, the Head of Energy Transition for the Westwood Global Energy Group, and you're listening to Energy Transition Now, where we discuss what the transition really means for the oil and gas and the broader energy industry. In this part of the series, we're taking a look at how individual companies are responding to that transition. And I'm really pleased to have Greta Tweed here, uh, the SVP for Marketing, Midstream and Processing, MMP, uh, low carb solutions at Equinor. Greta has more than 30 years experience in the oil and gas industry. After graduating from NTNU in Norway, she started working for Hydro and then later Statal, of course, later renamed Equinor. She's held several senior and exec management positions within the company, including as SVP for the Global Strategy Business Development, GSB, uh, Finance and Control, uh, uh, in finance and control and a uh, head of staff in London. Between 2014 and 2020, she was the SVP of the global valuation team and then the global project support and execution team within GSB. And during part of this period, she also, period, she also served as the head of mergers and acquisitions. On the 1st of April last year, she was then appointed the SVP for MMP Low Carbon Solutions. Greta, it's really super to have you here on the podcast a very warm welcome thank you now it is a particularly warm welcome i suppose because i can see that since you started your role last year um you have been very busy and of course equinor has also been very busy um and we're speaking just a few days after equinor has had its capital markets day uh, where the company presented its new strategy, um, I guess, ultimately creating a step change in its energy transition ambitions. Um, so to get us started, can I ask you, um, what are what are now Equinor's climate ambitions? Um, can you talk us maybe also through the main actions from that? Thank you, David, and, and I'd be pleased to do so. So Equinor has set an ambition to become net zero by 2050. This includes what we call scope one, two and three, meaning it also includes emissions from our products, oil and gas. And our pathway has three main elements. The first one is to reduce emissions from our own operations, so scope one. And Equinor already has an industry leading low carbon footprint from our own oil and gas operations. And we will continue to develop projects characterized by high value and low carbon. And we will continue to take down emissions from our own operations throughout the value chains with electrification of installations from shore and from offshore wind as key tools. Then secondly, we will develop more renewables. We will accelerate our renewables business aiming at installed equity capacity of 12 to 16 gigawatt by 2030. Our earlier goal was to have that capacity installed by 2035. Uh, our focus will be on four to five regional offshore wind clusters, building on our offshore experience and competitive edge. And uh, we believe that two thirds of the installed capacity will be within offshore wind. So also some onshore. Uh, we were an early mover in offshore wind and we will continue seeking attractive wind prospects in markets with favorable framework conditions. And uh, we are also taking part in onshore renewables uh, with our ownership share in uh, and partnership with Scartec Solar as an example. So the third one is that we will develop low carbon solutions and an increasing number of nations and companies and cities have stating their net zero ambition and commitments. Actually, I believe it is 61% of the actually countries in the world have stated a net zero ambition. Uh, and this will drive the demand for CCS and clean hydrogen. Uh, 
uh, we see that the pathways towards net zero includes large amount of CCS and clean hydrogen as a prerequisite for getting there by 2050. And we believe that there will be a growing demand for carbon management solutions and clean hydrogen. We believe that Equinor is uniquely well positioned to be the leader in this development. Uh, and as you refer to on our Capital Markets Day, we introduced an ambition to have a CO2 transport and storage capacity of 15 to 30 million ton per year within 2035, which we believe will give us a market share of around 25%. Uh, we have also launched an ambition to develop clean hydrogen projects in three to five major European industrial clusters also within 2035. And um, when it comes to location, we focus on three main areas. It's the UK, it is the rest of Northwest Europe, and it's Norway. And in these clusters, we find industries that need clean hydrogen and carbon management solutions to maintain production and jobs in the low and zero carbon future. And here we can build on our experience, infrastructure and existing customer base, together with whom uh, we can develop solutions and projects. And uh, CCS and hydrogen offer an attractive value proposition within all four segments of industry, heat, power and transport. That's very comprehensive. Thank you very much, Greta. I mean, certainly, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the low carbon solution side of things. But maybe if we take a quick step back, in terms of the shape that Equinor will take going forward, in that sense, do, should we expect that from now on, the upstream business is slowly going to decline and all these other areas are going to grow? Or, or how is that looking for the for, for the shape of the company? For the shape of the company, we have a, a large oil and gas business in place. And we believe that we will stay uh, and even grow in our oil and gas production for the next uh, five to 10 years. But following that, uh, we we believe we might have a gradual decline in that. What we also announced yesterday was that uh, in 2030, approximately 50% of our investments will be through renewables and low carbon solutions. Okay, well that's that sounds like quite a a big rebalancing within within that period of time, um, and certainly very interesting. Um. In, in terms of, you know, clearly your focus is mostly on the CCS and the blue hydrogen side of things. Um, uh, w w one question I guess I would have is, is why should an oil company like Equinor take a role in this? So you've touched on this a little bit, but, you know, is, is this maybe not the technology that, I don't know, a, a company that's used to running regulated return assets uh, uh, sh should be charged with? As ultimately, I guess it's, it's almost like a waste management product in one way, uh, uh, if you look at it from that angle. Uh, what, what is it that someone like an Equinor or an oil and gas company can, can, can bring to the table and why should they be leading the charge in this? Well, in Equinor, we consider, first of all, CCS as vital to meet our net zero target, which includes scope one and two and three, as I mentioned. Um, so CCS, uh, I would say is an essential climate mitigation tool and all sustainable modeling shows that significant scale of CCS is required to reach this goal. Pathway to net zero indicates that we need seven to eight gigaton per year of CCS injection capacity to meet uh, a global warming goal of below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, and the most then we have the most common objection uh, towards CCS is whether it will ever be commercial uh, and uh, 
this perception is about to change, I believe. Uh, as we've seen lately or over the last few years, uh, the EU ETS price is accelerating and has almost doubled. And it is expected to reach uh, 100 euros per tonne in 2030. And several European countries are pushing CO2 costs towards the 200 euro per tonne mark in the same period. And meanwhile, economies of scale and technology development are expected to take the cost of capturing, transporting and storing CO2 below the 100 euro mark. And many of us, me included, believe carbon neutral industries will get a price premium for their products, uh, increasing their willingness to pay beyond the CO2 price level. But as indicated uh, by yourself, until such cost crossover between cost and a CO2 price is achieved, we do expect moderate returns uh, as projects will depend on government support. But we do believe we will see a similar value upgrade as we have actually experienced in offshore wind by entering early and potentially farming down when projects are firmed up. So for us, we uh, as an oil and gas company uh, now turning into an energy company, we consider ourselves as the basin master of the Norwegian continental shelf, which is our home turf. Um, and uh, what is mapped out is that the North Sea alone has a storage capacity of 200 gigaton uh, of CO2. And, and here it is Norway and UK that stands out. So together, actually, Norway and UK can store CO2 for 25 years of the entire world's uh, uh, need for CO2 storage capacity. Uh, and uh, of course, you can add capacity in the rest of the Norwegian shelf and of course, also worldwide. Uh, we are very well placed to take the leading role in building this CCS industry on the Norwegian shelf. And um, by having the oil and gas competence to build on, we have unique experience uh, from actually doing CCS and not very many are aware of this. We have done CCS on this Leipner uh, gas condensate field on the NCS for 25 years. And we have done the same for the Snowbit field in the Barents for 12 years. And now we are one of the driving forces uh, for developing Northern Light, which is a new uh, CCS uh, opportunity in Norway. Um, so I think uh, this could be a good business for us. And when it comes to hydrogen and why we look into blue hydrogen, this is actually a way to decarbonize our gas. So it is helping decarbonizing the scope three, which is part of our ambition as well. Okay, that's very interesting. I remember looking at your numbers, your targets as to how many um, tons you would like to, or capacity at least you'd like to store. And it certainly felt like, um, I haven't done the full comparison, but it certainly felt like you were setting the highest targets out of pretty much anyone in the industry for this. So it, it's really a core part of, of how you're looking um, at things. Um, w w when we come to something like blue hydrogen, though, I can see that it is important about decarbonizing um, uh, your gas. Uh, and, and obviously you have a big gas pro uh, portfolio at the moment. Um, part of the criticism, I guess, that's out in the industry, though, it, around blue hydrogen is around the fact that it's you know, it's only a temporary solution to the real problem or the real question we've got. And we should go straight to green hydrogen as an example, you know, use renewable capacity to to extend and build that rather than try and maintain ultimately, I guess, which is which is a hydrocarbon supply and remove what 90 plus percent of, of the CO2 and store that away. I'm assuming you don't share that, that that view, but it'd be good to just to hear your your view on the role of blue hydrogen versus green hydrogen. 
Yes, uh, and and very many ask that question. So it's it's very relevant, um, and and there is no doubt that green hydrogen is a desired decarbonisation tool, and that over time the energy system is moving in this direction when it comes to providing clean molecules. But the importance here is that green hydrogen does not have the muscle to lift the hydrogen economy or the infrastructure required to decarbonize towards 2030. And if you if you are willing to follow me in in a lot of numbers, but just to illustrate this, uh, then mm -hmm. I'd like to to take you through an exercise. Uh, if we look at Europe, uh, Europe today consumes about 8,000 terawatt hour of power from oil and gas annually. Uh, and then if we say, what does it take to eliminate the CO2 emissions from this energy demand? And, and then please be mindful, this is a simplistic illustration. First, uh, we assume that half of this can be solved by electrification. So batteries, electric cars, and all of this. So what does it need? Well, it needs renewable electricity generation. And this is a huge challenge in itself. Uh, and if covered by wind, for example, uh, we will require 250 doggy bank wind farm projects with all the phases. And then let me remind you that this is the world's biggest wind farm by a large scale. And it has taken us in Equinor almost 10 years to mature it. So then we used all the wind power in a way. So what about the other app? Let's aim to solve that by producing clean hydrogen. And if we are to produce green hydrogen, it will require about 150 new nuclear plants of the size of Hinkley Point, because we used all the renewable power, so we need clean power. And then we need to build electrolyzers that actually uh, split up the water into green hydrogen. And we need about 50,000 of the largest units in operations today, which is 10 megawatt each. And uh, Today in the world, about 100 of these are produced every year. So of course, technology development and innovation will help this, but that is the situation today. So then it will take 500 years. Um, but if we look at that for uh, creating blue hydrogen, well, it's a lot more realistic. First of all, the natural gas energy source and infrastructure already exist because we actually use it today. Uh, then we will need 500 reformers of one gigawatt each. And uh, the world today are producing about 100 of these each year. So uh, we will need about five years to succeed when it comes to blue hydrogen. So actually, I my feeling is producing the hydrogen uh, to which is required for the heart to bait sector will take time. So Equinor, we propose not to talk about green or blue, but actually green and blue. And blue will build up first, but also uh, green will come over time. And when I look at the IEA prognosis of hydrogen uh, requirements in 2050, they say that blue will build up uh, early, then green will come and take over. But still in 2050, there is the use of blue hydrogen. So you can talk about blue being in the intermittent, but how long time is the intermittent? If it is 30 year, well, then that's fine for me. Yeah, it's, very, it's a very interesting way of of looking at the question and, and thank you for breaking that down for us like that um and, and you're right i mean even the ipcc scenarios you know they were at 90 of them or so to get to 1.5 degrees um most of them if not all of them have um a role for ccs and certainly also for hydrogen uh and and, and i guess interestingly in particular the latest IEA scenario probably has more hydrogen than maybe a lot of people expected. So it certainly has a role to play. And, and there is that overlap between the two the two types. Uh, just listening to you there, maybe there's one follow-up question. Is, is part of 
the answer you're giving, you saying that it's just very difficult to build so many renewables in the space of time we have. Is that how I should interpret sort of the first part of your electrification point? The building renewable is, is of course, something we do all the time. Uh, but it, to, to, to actually provide 50% of the energy demand uh, in Europe by uh, renewables, it, it will take a lot of time to generate the capacity. And today, about 20%, I believe, of, uh, of the power in Europe is provided from renewable. So what we should first do is actually to build up to 100% of the power capacity. And then we can start turning then that into green hydrogen. Perfect, perfect, okay. And is there a space for green hydrogen in Equinol's um, portfolio? Uh, absolutely <laughs> absolutely we have we are engaged in both blue and green hydrogen so we don't say one or the other we have both uh, in our portfolio and uh, we like to be in both because we see the future for both and we need to and we love to like to be part of the development and the cost efficiency also on the green hydrogen perfect okay well maybe that's a good time then to talk about your portfolio that you are starting to build up uh, to create that position and, and reach those, uh, I don't want to say ambitious, but sort of you know, large targets you set for yourself. Uh, you know, maybe there's, could you spend a few minutes talking about that portfolio, how it's building up and, and, and where particularly you're focusing? Yes, and, and uh, let me talk first about what we do in the UK. As I mentioned earlier, we focus Norway, UK and Northwest Europe. And in UK, um, reason why we have quite a few projects there is that they've introduced by law that they will be net zero by 2050. And they also have a very ambitious emission reduction target for 2030 of a 68% uh, reduction. Uh, and UK have also put in place funding mechanisms uh, and are working very closely with the industry to develop business models to put in place terms that make environmental projects investable. Uh, UK also acknowledged that both blue and green hydrogen is required to meet the climate emission targets, so that is of course important to us as well. Uh, we have one project in Scotland together with SSE. Uh, it is a, uh, a natural gas fired power station with CCS, so carbon capture and storage. But maybe I will focus on the Humber and Teesside region. Um, and uh, maybe to stress that first, we are not in that region by accident. This is the region which is responsible for around 50% of all UK industrial emissions. It is where the major part of our Norwegian gas lands and where our power cables from Dogger Bank will hit shore. Uh, and it is the home to large existing gas customers as well. Uh, and the key feature in our Humber and Teesside value proposition is what we call the Northern Endurance Partnership, short, uh, uh, what we say NEP, um, a CO2 transport and storage network connecting Teesside and Humber to an extensive CO2 storage area. Uh, and uh, we will have the capacity uh, of 27 million tonnes per year. Um, and, and the CO2 storage is then the basis for our anchor project in Humber, the h to h Sultan is what we name it. It's a 600 megawatt blue hydrogen facility, setting up one of UK's oldest chemical parks, the Sultan, for fuel switching. And then also we have together with our long-standing customer SSE, we plan to add uh, a further 1.2 gigawatt of hydrogen production capacity and uh, build three low carbon CCGTs. Uh, one called KIDB2, which will run on a mix of hydrogen and natural gas. Another one called KIDB3, which will be equipped with uh, post-combustion CCS. And then one called KIDB Hydrogen Power Station, 
which will run solely on hydrogen and will probably be the first one in the world to do so. And, and once the infrastructure is built, uh, we then see the potential for the Dogger Bank offshore wind farm to provide electricity for green hydrogen deployment in the same area. And um, the last project for now uh, in this region is a project we call H21, where Equinor together with Northern Gas Networks and Cadent are planning to develop a very large blue hydrogen production facility. And the plan is to convert existing gas distribution pipeline to hydrogen and potentially allowing 40,000 businesses and 3.7 million households access to clean hydrogen. So that's very interesting and very exciting. And then we have similar value pr propositions uh, in northwest of Europe and also one potential in US. And, and maybe also to mention Norway, uh, the Norwegian government has uh, on the back of its CCS support also now cited high ambitions for hydrogen production. And we are working on a plan to develop a substantial clean energy system based on offshore wind and blue hydrogen in combination with large scale CCS that can support uh, existing industries in Norway and also potentially attract new industries. And maybe over time we can also expect uh, export this hydrogen to uh, Northwest Europe. We have also projects in Northwest Europe, but I guess this was quite a bit already. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, 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 it certainly is a lot. And I think what's fascinating to hear from my perspective actually is you're having to partner with a number of different players in that sense. So this is not just, how do you say, this Equinor going alone and uh, saying, look, we're, we're going to build a power plant, we're going to own the gas and the CCS plant, et cetera. You know, obviously, there's a number of stakeholders also um, in in those industrial hubs, and and whether you're partnering with them directly or maybe even indirectly, there's a lot of people to work with here. So, I mean, is it fair to say that ultimately, partnerships and stakeholder management skills are, are a core part of of achieving what you're looking to do here? That's a very fair statement. Uh, uh, so, as I talked about our partnership with SSC. And in the NEP, the Transport and Storage System in UK, we are together with uh, Shell, Total, ENI, BP and National Grid. So that is to mention some partnerships. And then maybe also let me mention the project we have uh, together with ThyssenKrupp Steel in Germany. Um, ThyssenKrupp Steel emits the same amount of CO2 every year as we do from the entire offshore business in Norway. So it's big. Uh, so we're working together with ThyssenKrupp Steel to see how they can convert their process uh, to use hydrogen instead of coal in the process. And of course, if they can do that switch, that will dramatically reduce their uh, emissions. And we are working with them day on their plant to see how they can change this. And we are working with them to see how we can produce the um, hydrogen uh, for them to use. Okay. I, th I think if, if, if I look at that sort of portfolio as a whole, there's an interesting point that comes out. And I think something that makes a lot of maybe sense to me and others is clearly helping someone like a ThyssenKrupp, for example, to decarbonize. These are the hard to abate sectors that, that people are going to struggle with. If I was to ask maybe a little bit more of a controversial question though, around, for example, the new build around CCGTs, that's actually a new power plant being built um, in the UK, um, which obviously has some CCGTs already and other other new power uh, being built, nuclear, etc. How, how does that marry in your mind from the kind of concept where a lot of talk people talk about CCS as the hard to abate, you know, the last sort of drop of CO2 that we need to get rid of or uh, versus let's build a new CCGT and then add, um, uh, add CCS to it. To, to make it low carbon. Does that does that make sense in your mind? 
Yes, it makes sense. And and I think UK have been extraordinarily good at reducing your emissions. And you have more or less phased out coal uh, and you've been very successful in your uh, offshore wind um, development. Uh, but what is the thing when you replace offshore wind with or oh, sorry, uh, when you replace uh, coal with offshore wind is that the wind is not blowing all the time. And then what do you do when the wind is not blowing? Uh, and then you need uh, backup uh, and that backup can be CCGTs. So the CCGT plans that we are uh, partnering up to build is for backup uh, for the wind power. Uh, and then you want the backup power to be having the least amount of emissions as possible. And the old CCGTs are emitting quite a bit of CO2. And if you replace them with this new one, you can actually make it clean. Also the backup power. OK, That's, I, 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 I can see the value proposition there. Um, maybe as a last question for you then, you've obviously talked us through a lot of things here already. Um, carbon management in itself, uh, which I think you, know, you called it also carbon management as a whole within Equinor, you know, comes in many forms. Um, you know, it's broadly about the mitigation concept and then the removal of carbon as well. Um, there are obviously other solutions that we haven't talked about at the moment, and, and they might not be core to what you're doing, but I'd like to just hear your view on things like uh, nature-based solutions, direct air capture, et cetera, that other companies, and maybe not Equinor, um, are participating in. And it may be useful to hear from you why that might be. And, and we are participating. We're not a very active uh, participant, but we are participating. And we are actually uh, participating to compensate for our travel emissions, for example. Uh, but we will also need uh, nature-based solutions to, to close the gap and be net zero by 2050, we believe. But first of all, we need to focus on reducing our own emissions. Then we need to focus on capturing and storing, uh, and we need to focus on efficiency measures and then last of everything is the nature-based solution but i can mention one example uh, because we are together with 11 other companies working to decarbonize the humber cluster as i talked about earlier uh, and we hope to do so by 2040 to actually make it net zero or even zero, we need some negative emissions. And how can we get that? That is from Draxis installations, we can do BECs. And if you burn this material and you collect the CO2, then you have negative emissions. So we plan to collect that CO2 and to store that CO2 to compensate for, for other hard to abate uh, emissions. So yes, we are participating. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, also our Northern Lights project in Norway, uh, which is actually the first of a kind uh, CCS solution where we can uh, we can transport and uh, store any CO2 from any customer that has access to a port. And we are in dialogue with various uh, BEX companies that want to store their CO2 in Northern Lights uh, and then creating these negative emissions. Uh, we also have an MOU uh, with uh, Microsoft and uh, they are looking at various ways to decarbonize and going actually not net zero but negative on this to compensate for earlier emissions and they are studying DAX as part of that. Fascinating. OK, so there's there is a broad range of solutions, but there are some things we need to do first. Um, OK, well, thank you for joining us today, Greta, and thank you for taking us through, I guess, initially um, Equinor strategy, but then in particular this, uh, on CCS and hydrogen and the role that, that has to has to play going forward. There's clearly a lot you're doing and I can see you're very passionate about it. So that's really good to see. But thank you. Thank you. Perfect. And thanks, everyone else, for listening as well. 
Hope you enjoyed it. Please make sure you subscribe, give us a great rating and share. And talk to you next time.